Hey folks, how you guys doing? Hope you're all having a great day today. This is the case construction that I completed in the previous video, part one of this series, and it is not glued together. It's just stuck together with all the joints, uh, all the joinery, and that's okay. I'm going to move on from this, set it aside, and in this video, we're going to be working on just the base. Yeah, that's right, Jay, and this is something that I normally don't do, uh, and that is make a prototype. This is just two by four material that I ripped into basically two by two material and I pocket hole screwed it together. Uh, what this did is it, it gave me a very fast and quick way to have something to set in place in my living room, set the top on top of it and work out any changes that I wanted to make uh, visually before I start making the project. Uh, and I'm glad I did because I, I need to adjust the height just slightly, which is fine. Uh, but most importantly, the biggest change that this allowed me to see was that in, in my initial design, I had both the front and back rail, well, all of the rails, a lot thinner than what they are in this little prototype. Uh, and because, like I said, this is like, I guess, two by two material, uh, the, the side rails, all the rails are pretty much the same thickness as the legs. And this made me realize that I want the rails to be much thicker than the skinny rails that I had in the initial design. So for that reason, uh, I'm going thicker with the rails. I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, but basically a, a prototype that I normally don't do uh, made me visualize some changes. So now that I have all of the final exterior dimensions finalized for the base and uh, some changes figured out, I can move on to the actual material for the base. And that material is ambrosia maple. I've got a few boards here to, to choose from. Ouch, this is all eight quarter, eight quarter stock. And this one doesn't have as much streaking in it as this one does, the ambrosia figure. And by the way, ambrosia is not a specific species of maple. This ambrosia maple, what it is, is uh, this is just regular hard maple that has been infected by the ambrosia beetle. So anytime you see this streaking, what that is is somewhere near the center of it, you'll see some bug holes. And that's from the ambrosia beetle getting into the wood and depositing a fungus that changes the color of the surrounding material. As always, my lumber milling process starts by laying out each part on the roughs on boards and then cross cutting them to rough length a little bit longer than the final dimensions at the miter saw. And as these boards are cut, you can really see how deep the ambrosia streaking is. This stuff is truly some beautiful wood to work with. Next up for this batch is to rip the pieces to rough width. And normally I'd use the bandsaw for ripping rough sawn lumber because if the board has any major cup bow or twist, you can end up removing some of the supporting material while it's being cut, which can cause the board to shift into the blade. On a bandsaw, it's not that big of a deal most of the time, but on a table saw, it can sometimes cause a dangerous situation with kickback. In this case, the board was flat enough to use on the table saw, but I did feel the boards releasing some tension while being cut. Nothing major, but I knew that I didn't have enough time left in the day to get started on the joinery, so I let the pieces sit for the night to give them more time to move if needed. The next day I used the jointer to get the leg pieces flat and square on two adjacent faces and then I used the planer to get the pieces to their final thickness. These are square pieces so they're the same thickness in both directions. When selecting material for table legs or corners where two adjacent faces will be visible at the same time, it's best to select rift sawn lumber, lumber that has the grain close to a close to about a 45 degree angle to all adjacent faces when looking at the end grain. However, I just wasn't feeling it with the rift sawn sections that I had. The ambrosia streaking really wasn't strong in those areas. So instead, I decided to just go for the areas with the highest concentration of ambrosia streaking. And the result was four blanks that are they're primarily flat sawn or quarter sawn depending on which side you look at them. But my thinking here is that in this particular case, it's going to be acceptable because the ambrosia streaking is what's really going to stand out and grab the attention. That's where your eyes are going to go anyway. Uh, the difference between the flat song and quarter sawn grain of the maple, all of that's going to be secondary. A couple of the pieces had a soft spot here or there in the streaking, I guess where a bug hole was kind of sliced down the length of it. So I used an awl and my marking knife to dig out all of the loose material. And it's important to do this because all of that soft material can easily flake away or peel off down the road even after finish is applied. 
And I found that out the hard way with a project I completed several years ago that had stain applied to it. The soft spot flaked away and revealed some of the wood where the stain hadn't penetrated. Then the legs were cut to their final length at the miter saw and this is the final grain appearance on the legs. I think the vast majority of people won't let their eyes pass the ambrosia streaking to see the quarter sawn versus the flat sawn grain. There's four legs and each leg gets two through mortises which means eight through mortises total. And I went ahead and laid out the start and stop location of each of these with just a pencil and then drew a line between each set to have a clear visual guide to know where each mortise goes at first glance. To remove the majority of the mortise waste as well as to establish a clean sidewall of each one of the mortises, I chose to use my plunge router with a one half of an inch spiral upcut bit. A couple of years ago I made a universal edge guide attachment for it that makes mortises really easy. Making the mortise is pretty simple. I have the router depth set to go slightly more than halfway through the leg piece, so to achieve a through mortise, the cut needs to be made from both faces. And I've got the fence on the base set so that the router bit is slightly off center on the leg piece, which means making a pass from each side will result in a perfectly centered mortise. You can also see another leg blank underneath the dust collection side of the router base for extra support. Now I've used this router setup to make mortises a couple dozen times. It's easy and effective, but I've only used it with a half inch router bit a couple times. Most of the time it's been with a quarter inch router bit. And this time I made a mistake. Now normally I make a full depth cut at the start and stop locations of the mortise before removing the material in the middle. And this gives a dead space that provides an audio as well as a kind of a tactile feedback to let you know you've reached the end of the mortise when you lose visibility of the stop location. The problem I had here was that I was using a one half of an inch diameter upcut spiral router bit and it was set, the router was set at its lowest speed, which caused the bit to grab uncontrollably at one time as I was plunging. It's a technique I learned from others as far as using a full depth plunge in the start and stop location, and I've always used it with good results. I don't think the grab would have occurred if the router was running at full speed or maybe if a one quarter of an inch router bit was used. Either way, it caused too much damage to use that leg. So luckily I had another off cut that was really close to the size I needed and the planer height was still set to the final thickness of the leg. So I went ahead and made another one real quick. And that is exactly why so many people plan for an extra leg when making tables. With the bulk of the mortises cut, I used a combination square and a marking knife to establish the short edges of each of the mortises, making sure that they were all the same distance from the top of each leg. Then each of the mortises were squared off with a chisel and I'm not sure why, but I felt like this process was the longest by far on the base construction. Even with removing the bulk of the waste with the router, it just felt like this step was never going to end. I started the next day by finishing milling the rail pieces to their final thickness. I also made sure to mill an extra scrap piece to the same thickness as the rails so that it can be used as a setup block in just a bit. And then I cut them to their final length at the table saw. Now I used the table saw here because I noticed a little inconsistency when cutting the legs to their final length with my miter saw previously. And the table saw with a cross cut sled, it, it's always the more accurate choice. My method of choice for tenons has always been to use a dado stack in the table saw. It's much more precise than using my bandsaw and I find it to be easier to set up and dial in than using a regular tenon jig. It's just really quick and easy. I have a routine that I always go through every time I cross cut with the dado stack. First I install a sacrificial fence on the miter gauge and always, always, always re-square the miter gauge to the saw fence. Never just think that it's square because the last time you used it it was square. Then make a cut through the sacrificial fence a little bit higher than what is needed. Then drill a hole above the slot in the fence and secure a sacrificial board that is thicker than the dado stack in line and centered with the dado stack. This quick setup creates a dust shroud to direct most of the waste into the table where, it's, where it belongs really, so it's not being thrown at you or all over the shop. And it also fully encases the blade as you're making the cut, which is never a bad thing in regards to safety. Now a test block can be used to dial in the height of the dado stack. And normally I'd go for a tight fit right off the saw if these were you know, a closed mortise and tenon joint. 
but in this case my objective was to make the tenons just a tiny bit too thick at first. Because the through tenons will be visible, I didn't want to take any chances and wanted to make sure that the final fitting was done with a rabbiting plane. Then the fence is set to determine the length of each tenon, and with this setup, every one of the tenons can be cut. This setup establishes the thickness of all of the tenons. A different setup is needed for the height or the width of the short rail tenons, so the dado stack was lowered and then these were cut next. The process was repeated for the rest of the tenon cuts, finishing with the top of the long rails. And because the long rails are going to stick up higher than the legs, the tenon is cut so that it is offset to one side. I wanted to do all of the rail shaping before fitting the tenons, so next up is the long rail cove cut on the table saw. Here's an end grain diagram that I drew for reference, and also to be used as a setup block. This is drawn in the orientation that it will be on in the completed project, which is 90 degrees to the table saw surface as it will be cut, so bear with me on this terminology. My initial cove layout had a rise of 3 8 of an inch and a run of 1 inch, but after looking at it drawn to scale, I thought that it would be interesting to play around with the dimensions and make the cove larger, so I drew it again with twice as much rise, but as you will see in just a little bit, I ended up sticking with my original dimensions. Now on to setting up the table saw, and I find that using a dado stack for the cove leaves a smoother cut, but of course a regular saw blade can be used as well. First, the blade height is set to the rise dimension, then the front of the cut at this position is marked on the insert plate. Then the center of the blade is marked on the insert plate as well, and if you have a zero clearance insert, just divide the opening in half. Then use your setup block as shown to find the approximate fence angle. The right side of the end grain diagram pivots on the front mark until the left edge intersects the center line. Now my zero clearance opening wasn't quite a perfect zero clearance with my dado stack, so I shifted both points to the left by about 1 16th of an inch. But regardless, this will give you the, you know, the approximate starting position for your cove. So this is my fence setup. It's a piece of plywood clamped to the back of the saw and then screwed to a board that was a snug fit in the front rail, which was also clamped in place. Here you can better see the starting position of the fence and how it was determined with the setup block and reference lines. Now I say starting position because you can very easily play around with the angle a bit to tweak the radius and the location of the cove while still maintaining the same rise and run. And that's exactly what I did with a few scrap blocks and held them under the top case just to see how they looked and see which one I liked the best. And this is how chewed up my fence ended up looking. You can modify the cove radius and position while keeping the rise and run the same by pivoting on the front reference mark at the right side of the blade and rotating the fence clockwise to get a cove with a radius closer to the radius of the saw blade or pivot on the fence counterclockwise to get a cove with a radius much smaller and also push the cove to one side of the run direction. Here are some examples of what I'm talking about. The left cove on the far right board was cut with the fence pivoted clockwise and you can see that the radius is the largest. When holding this piece under the case, it just felt like the cove wasn't there. It wasn't easily identifiable, almost like it was almost like a, a simple angled face. The cove on the far left, however, is the one that I actually went with. It still has the same rise and run, but because I pivoted the fence counterclockwise, the radius is much smaller and it's offset to one side of the run direction. Also, keep in mind that if, if this was cut with a single table saw blade instead of a dado stack, the other half of the cove would probably be cut as well from the back side of the blade, but because a dado stack was used, the width of the stack created a flat spot instead. With the setup complete, the cove can be cut on the actual long rails, and there's just something really satisfying about making a curved cut on a tool that specializes in straight cuts.
The primary coves turned out great, and to make them kind of flow around the upper part of the rail, as well as be able to see the profile of the cove a little bit more, I cut another cove into a template and transferred that to the back side of both sides of each long rail, and then cut away the bulk of the waste at the bandsaw. The secondary coves were cleaned up by hand, starting with 80 grit sandpaper wrapped around a mini baseball bat and moving all the way up to 320 grit. Now this, this little mini baseball bat has been super handy in my shop because it's, it's basically a tapered cylinder. So you have all kinds of, uh, you have a variable radius sanding block basically to sand the inside of interior radiuses. It's just been way handy to have here in the shop. It's actually a, a practice lathe project that a friend of mine made. So if you have a lathe, turn yourself a mini baseball bat for a sanding block. It's pretty handy in my shop anyway. Okay, so the final dimension and shape of all of the rails is established at this point, so it's time to fit the tendons. And I used a shoulder plane to establish a clean shoulder all the way around the tendon, a chisel to undercut the shoulder near the base of the tendon just slightly to provide a little room for glue squeeze out, and then a rabbiting block plane to trim the tenon cheeks to a perfect fit. The result is a really nice tight fitting through tenon. Rinse and repeat for all eight tenons. Up until now, all of the joints were labeled on the outside. Now these marks will obviously be removed when everything is sanded, so once each joint was fitted, the tenon and inside of the mortise were labeled to verify that they go back together in the same orientation. The final touch before a complete dry assembly was to add a chamfer to the top and bottom of each leg. This was quick and easy at my router table with a sacrificial push block. Adding a chamfer really finishes off the legs. On top, it makes the ambrosia streaking flow better from the face to the end grain. And the chamfers on bottom add a really nice shadow line to make the piece kind of have a slightly lighter or more of a, a floating feel, which isn't really going to be noticed because this is going to sit on carpet, but thumbs up anyway. And then finally, the first full dry assembly of the base which was pretty rewarding. This thing looks pretty cool in person. So that's where I'm going to leave this one. In the next video, I'll disassemble everything, do any surface prep, apply the initial finish, determine any last minute adjustments to the tenons like possible wedges, assemble, complete the final chamfers on the dovetails and tenons, and then complete the finishing stage. So yeah, subscribe so you don't miss that video. Uh, check out my website at jayscustomcreations.com. You guys have a great day. And I'll talk to you in the next video.